Today we're going to be talking about properties of data, how you can massage raw data into a format that you can use, and how you can use tools to turn those raw data into something usable and using visualization tools into something beautiful. The truth is, a lot of data come to you in very dirty and unusable forms. And a necessary evil of this process is getting those data in a form where you can use them. It's an unavoidable step, and no two sources of data are the same. So it's really something you need to figure out for each data set individually. It gets easier with practice, but there's no simple set of recipes that you can use to get the data in the form that you need it in. I'm going to show you an example of how I do it for one particular data set. As you'll see in your first assignment, every data set is different and presents its own challenges. So thus, the goal here is not to teach you how to do this, but to show you the kind of end results that you want to have so you can start telling stories from your data. In particular, we're going to focus on how to tell stories with pictures. The same pre-processing is necessary for everything we'll be doing in this class. Whether it's making predictions or clustering, you still need to have your data in a usable form. And by the end of this lecture and our exercises in class, you should have all the skills you need to tackle homework one. We're going to be talking about two very specific things today. One is ggplot2, a package that's a part of R that lets you use your data to tell a story using graphs and figures. We'll also be talking about one particular example of a source of data, Capital Bike Share, and how we can use those data provided by Capital Bike Share to understand how people use bicycles in our city. Let's refresh your memory about some of the terminology that we'll be using. A data set has different components. One way of dividing up these components is into input and output. Input is what you always know. This is sometimes called an independent variable, a regressor, or a feature. This is what you'll always know about an observation. Sometimes, depending on the data set, you'll also have an output, what you're trying to learn. This is called an independent variable, the regressand, the response variable, or the label. Now, sometimes you don't always have something that you're trying to learn from the data. For example, in the case of unsupervised learning, you have what you have. You're trying to discover some property about the data that no one is giving to you by example. One thing to keep in mind is that not all data are usable. When you download a piece of information from the web, there could be extraneous information that you don't want to include. Uh, most data have some sort of identifier. Uh, it could also be metadata, when the data were created, who collected it, how much it costs. And one piece of critical thinking that you need to do in gathering data is deciding what is important and what should I exclude? And a lot of times this will be a judgment call. But it's very important for you to remove pieces of data that aren't useful so that you don't waste disk space, so that you don't learn inconsequential or coincidental correlations, and so that you have an understanding of what's really important. Recall the distinction between discrete and continuous data. So discrete data, also called categoric data, are bins that you group data into. There's no in-between. You, you can ask what's the most frequent value, and, and that would make sense. Continuous data, uh, sometimes called numeric data, um, have an in-between. You can take the average of two examples of uh, continuous data. And you can ask questions like, uh, what would this data look like if it were 10% more x, where x is some continuous value? And now that we've refreshed those ideas, we can start moving on to our test bed for today, which is Capital Bike Share. Capital Bike Share, until recently, was the largest bike share system in the United States. New York's is now a little bit bigger. One of the great things about Capital Bike Share is that it publicly releases 
information about who's riding bikes in its system. These data allow you to answer important questions. Some questions are really long-term questions. Where should new stations be? What businesses are benefiting from Capital Bike Share? And you might say, you're getting a lot of business from Capital Bike Share customers. Maybe you want to buy some advertising. How much should you price Capital Bike Share? Should you give discounts for certain times of the day? How do you coordinate Capital Bike Share with other forms of transit? And then there are very practical questions like, does a station have too many or too few bikes? Both are problems. If there are too few bikes, and if someone wants to come up and borrow a bike, there might not be enough. If there are too many bikes, that's also a problem, because then if someone wants to return a bike to that station, there's no slot for the bike to be returned. And the problem of rebalancing is a, a continuous one. 24 hours a day, they need to make sure that their bike racks are not too full and not too empty. And so if they can predict when a particular station will be full or empty, they can help ameliorate that problem. We're going to begin by downloading the Capital Bike Share data and getting it into a form that we can use. Let's begin by downloading some data from Capital Bike Share. I go to their data trip history page and then click on the most recent link there. After that downloads, I will then go to Google Drive and then create a new spreadsheet document. I now have a blank spreadsheet document. I will then import the data that I downloaded into my spreadsheet. It will think about this for a while and then give a preview of the data on the right hand side of the screen. Everything looks like it loaded OK, so I'll hit the Import button. After the data have been loaded, you should see an Open Now button that will take you to the spreadsheet. Now, I will drag down the header bar, and we have nice data. We have the start and the end station for each of these rides. There are also some data that you might not care about. For instance, the bike. So I will remove this column. And we also don't care about the terminal, so I will also remove this column. So now we have a bunch of information about rides. To reflect that, I will rename the station Rides. However, the information we have about the stations isn't very useful because it's in the form of text address. What we really want is more detailed information about the stations, such as where they are geographically, say in terms of latitude and longitude coordinates that you could put into a mapping application or to your GPS. Luckily, Capital Bike Share also provides this information in the form of an XML file on their website. This is what that XML file looks like. It has a list of stations, and with each station, it has both the name of the station, the latitude and the longitude, and a number of other information that might be useful, such as the number of bikes available and whether it has empty stations that people can put bikes into. The question is, how do we get this information into the same data format as our ride information. So first, let's create a new sheet that will hold station information. Into this sheet, we will want to put the ID of a station, its name, the latitude of the station, and the longitude of the station. Now we need to import this information from the XML file. To do this, we will use formulas that are provided to us by Google Spreadsheets. To enter a formula, click on any cell, and then hit the equals key. Now type the name of the function that you want to use. 
In this case, we want to use a function called import XML. Now, when you type a function, it will give you information about how to use this function. So this function has two arguments, the URL of the file we want to get, and then the query we want to execute on that XML file. Now the URL that we want to use is this, which I will copy and paste into this formula. And the query that we want to use is that we want to create one row for every time we see the element called name. And so this will look at the XML file for every entry that has a name field, and we'll put this into our spreadsheet. So we've typed in our formula. We'll be reusing a similar formula, so I'll copy it, and then I'll hit Enter. After I hit Enter, it grabs all that information from the XML file and places it into the spreadsheet. So in the ID column, I don't actually want the name, I want the ID of the station, so I'll slightly change the formula so that it puts in the ID. So this goes to the XML file and grabs all the IDs. Similarly for latitude, we will change the formula slightly so that it looks for the latitude field. And for the longitude, we'll put in the longitude. So now we have a complete list of all of the station names with their latitude and longitude. So now we have a sheet that has all of the information about stations. What we want to do, however, is to get that information into this ride spreadsheet so we know where each ride begins and ends. To get that information in here, we first need a place for it to go, so we'll create some new columns. These columns will hold the start latitude and longitude, and the end latitude and longitude. Now, what we need to do is for each station, we need to look at the station name and then find the corresponding row in the station sheet and then look up the latitude and longitude and to put these guys into these two columns. So there is a function that allows us to do that in Google Spreadsheets. The name of that function is called VLOOKUP. So again, we'll create a new function by pressing the Enter key and then typing the name of the function VLOOKUP. Now again, when you type the name of a function, you get help explaining what that function does. So the first argument of the function is the value you want to look up in the table. In this case, it's the name of the station. So we click on that cell. The next argument is where you want to look. So we type in the name of the sheet, station. After you type the name of the sheet, you need to put an exclamation mark because it's going to be looking at cells in a different sheet. Now what cells is it going to look at? It's going to look at cells B, C, and D. Given cells B, C, and D, you want it to look up the value in the B column and then return the value in the C column. So you type station exclamation mark B colon D. Then you want it to return the second of those, the latitude, 
And the final argument says whether to look for inexact matches. We only want exact matches, so we'll tell it false. So now, after we've done that, it goes, looks up this guy in the station's spreadsheet, and then fills in that value. Now we want it to do that for all of the entries in this column. Now we do something similar for this value. We put in the formula and we change it slightly. Instead of looking up the second cell in columns B through D, we want it to look up the third cell, the longitude. And so now it does that and we'll apply this to the entire column. For the in latitude, we'll need a similar formula, but now the lookup value is different. Instead of looking in column C in this sheet, we want to look up column E instead. And instead of looking up the third cell, we wanted to look up the second cell, the cell containing the latitude. For whatever reason, it didn't find a latitude value for 23rd and E Street Northwest. If this were more than a demo, we would figure out why that was happening. Maybe there's something wrong in the lookup file. Maybe there's a typo. Maybe this is something we could correct automatically. Since this is just a demo, I won't bother to correct it. So now we need to put in the final formula. And just like we changed the start latitude into the start longitude by changing the 2 to the 3, the same thing works for the in longitude. We'll get the same error again because it's not finding that station. And we now have our spreadsheet mostly filled in with a few missing values. So now that we have all of our data in the spreadsheet, we need to output it again in a format we can use. So we'll go to File, and then Download As, and we'll download this current sheet, the ride sheet that has all the information about where each ride began and ended, as a CSV file. And that will download as a CSV file that we can then use in R or our favorite application. So let's see an example of how we can load our data into R. I'm using RStudio, which nicely shows all of the available files in the working directory. In this case, the file that we want to read in is this file called cabirides.x.cvs, what I exported from Google Docs and is also available from the course webpage. I'm going to use the function called readcsv. And if you do question mark read CSV, you can see all of the options available. But we're going to use a very simple form of the command. And we'll only type in the name of the file. And so when I hit enter, this will create an object called a data frame. We want this data frame to be accessible later, so let's create a name of a variable to store this in. So we'll call this variable rides. And to assign the output of this function to the variable rides, we're going to use the assignment operator, which is the left hand arrow and then the minus sign, creating a big arrow that reads in the data from this file and stores it into the variable called rides. I hit enter and now R Studio tells me that I have a new variable called rides with about 6,000 rows and 14 columns. This is called a data frame 
in R. To get a summary of this data frame, we can use the command head on rides, and this will give us a sense of what the data look like. And so we see all of the columns, and I will, to access one of the columns, we can use the dollar sign and then the name of the column. So, for example, if we're interested in the duration of the ride, we can just look at that column. I'll again just use head so that we don't get all 6,000 of them. And here are the first few examples of what the durations look like. Similarly, if we wanted the start station, we could write that as well. So this is how you load it into regular R. Let's also try it out in Rattle. So I'll load the library for Rattle and then start Rattle up. Now that Rattle is loaded, I need to load in the data. Click on the file name and then hit the execute button. After the data are loaded, it tries to figure out the type of data for each of the columns. So it has classified most of these as either numeric or categoric. And it has done a reasonable job of most of these, but it doesn't quite have start date correct, nor does it have the end date correct. So we need to reformat them before it loads into Rattle so it can interpret these correctly, but for the time being, we'll just ignore them. We'll also ignore the byte column. After I've clicked on these, I will hit Execute so that it will ignore those variables. We'll now go to the Explore tab and now see what's going on with some of our data. I'll first do the Summary. It will now give you a report on all of the variables. For instance, on the duration, it will give you the minimum duration, the maximum duration, the mean duration, and the median duration. What you're looking for out of these information is reasonableness. Does it make sense that the maximum duration was on the order of 14 hours. That's a little long, but it's not unreasonable. Similarly, does it make sense that Massachusetts Avenue and DuPont Circle was the most common start station and also the most common end station? Does it also make sense that the time of day that rides began go from 0 to 24? That makes sense because it's you have 24 hours in a day. Let's take a look at duration and see how it changes based on the kind of user. When this comes up, you can see that casual users tend to ride bikes longer than subscribers. This makes sense as casual users are more likely to be tourists and subscribers are more likely to be using the bikes for commuting. That's all I wanted to say about Rattle and visualization. While Rattle has some rudimentary tools for visualization, that's not its strengths. Its strengths is in the modeling, so we'll focus on a different tool for visualizing our data. Instead of using Rattle for visualizations, we're instead going to use a package called ggplot2. Now before you can use ggplot2, you have to install it, just like you installed Rattle. So execute a command, install.packages ggplot2. While Rattle and R have built-in visualization packages, they're difficult to use, and frankly, they're a little bit ugly. And ggplot2 is the state-of-the-art standard for doing publication-quality visualizations. In addition to being high quality, it's also fairly easy to use. It follows a grammar. This, this is called the Grammar of Graphics, coined by Lee Wilkinson. 
And you combine different components of graphical elements to create one plot. One of the nice things about ggplot2 is that it's easy to get started and create competent graphics, but, but as you get more and more immersed in it, you'll find yourself asking, can I do X in ggplot2? And the answer is almost certainly yes. As you get more and more advanced, you'll find yourself thinking about different visualization techniques, and most of them are supported by ggplot2. ggplot2 also provides a function called qplot for quickplot. It is fairly easy to use, but it is so different from the rest of ggplot2 that you'll end up picking up bad habits. So I encourage you just to use ggplot2 by itself without going through qplot. Here are the main things you need to know in order to understand how ggplot2 works. First, the function ggplot. ggplot is the function that you call to specify the data set and the variables that you want to plot from that data set. Geoms are geometric objects that you add to the plot. These can be lines, these can be polygons, these can be bars. We'll see examples of these. Once you have some aspects that you've added to the plot, you can then change the aesthetics of that plot. You can change the shape, the transparency, the color, the fill, the line type. This allows you to customize the look of your various geometries. The last element is scales, which changes how your data will be plotted. This allows you to switch between continuous and discrete ways of visualizing your data or transforming your data to use, for example, log scale when your data are very big. Now we'll get back to the capital bike share data in a second, but just to play around on simpler, smaller data, let's use some of the built-in data that comes with R and ggplot2. The iris data set is one of these. It contains data on a variety of plants. You can use the head command to see what these data look like. Let's start plotting our data. So if we use the command ggplot using the data set iris, telling it to use the length versus the width as the dimensions of our plot and to display those as points in a graph, we get a plot that looks like this. ggplot defines what is going to be plotted. Where are you going to get your data from? On top of that, you can add layers of geometric objects, statistical models, and panels, all using the same data. For example, if you wanted to increase the size of the individual dots, you could change the geometry of the point to say that the size should become 3. Also in the iris data set is information about the species of the plant. If we want to see how the size changes based on the species of the plant, we can add in a new aesthetic saying that the color should reflect the different kinds of species. So to the aesthetic command, we add in that the color should be based on the species. But one thing that we're missing out here is that there are some points that overlap, particularly between the Virginica and the Versicolor species. If we want to see where these points overlap, we can add in another differentiation between species, not just using color, but also using the shape. And when we do that, we can see when Versicolor and Virginica overlap. This is a data set that shows different birth weights based on ethnicity. This is called a box plot. Inside each of the boxes lies half the data. This shows the typical values of observations. If we're interested in seeing in more detail how a particular observation is distributed, we can use a histogram. The histogram has two dimensions. The x dimension shows values 
and the y dimension shows how often you see an observation with a particular x value. This shows how long you have to wait between eruptions of the geyser Old Faithful in a U.S. national park. From this, you can see that the average waiting time is around 80 minutes between eruptions of the geyser. However, the bins of this histogram are so wide that it hides some of the variation in the data. Let's see another version of this histogram with narrower bins. Here we can see that it actually has a bit more of a bimodal distribution. There seems to be a peak around 50 and then a larger peak around 75 or 80. Particularly for temporal data, often it makes sense to show data as a line. For that, we can use the line geometry. Here we're plotting the variable anomaly 10y against the year variable. We can also include uncertainty when we have error bars around a measurement. You can either specify the uncertainty directly, as shown here, or you can use the smooth geometry to do that for you automatically. An alternative to the histogram for showing the distribution of a variable is a density plot. The reason I really like ggplot2 is that it can produce vector images. Most of the image formats that you're familiar with are probably raster graphics that store images as individual pixels. Vector graphics, in contrast, store images as instructions for how to explicitly draw the image line by line. This makes it much easier to produce publication quality images that scale well, whether you're printing a paper or a 10 foot wide poster. ggplot2 provides the ggsave command to write your plots that you've produced either in a variable or on the screen to a file. Now that I've introduced ggplot2, let's try using it on our capital bike share data. We'll use some of the geometries that I showed you before, but we'll also introduce new geometries and new features of ggplot2 while we're at it. So first, let's get an outline of the District of Columbia, where all of our bike stations are. ggplot2 provides data about the shapes of the states in terms of their latitude and longitude. Then let's plot the shape of the District of Columbia. This is what the District of Columbia looks like as an outline. We can then add our data to show how many bikes were checked out from each station. We can plot the stations in such a way that the size of the dot shows how busy the station is. We do that by setting the size aesthetic to be one of our variables in the data set, in this case, the count of how many bikes were checked out of that place. The facet command allows you to create a grid of similar plots that only differ in a single variable. So here, we're making a two-dimensional grid where the rows are the types of checkout, either leave or return, and the columns are the time of day. Now, if we just type in these two variables that happen to be in our data set, 3, 2, 1, the facet command takes as input two columns in your data. In this case, they're called type and time. It then creates a grid out of that. But as you can see here, if you just put it in like this, it gives you the columns in the wrong order. So what we have to do instead is tell it how to order the time of day. So here you can see the evolution of bike usage over time. This shows that the system is still being extensively used, even late into the night. This might imply that it's being used as an alternative to Metro, which shuts down between midnight and 6 a.m. Another interesting pattern that we can see is the pattern of commuting. For example, you can look in the late morning column and see that 
while people are leaving from all parts of the network, the check-ins in the late morning are concentrated downtown near DuPont Circle. Here we see an example of automatic error bars being added by the smooth geometry. Here we can see how the distance that people travel vary over time. And you can see that people are traveling longer distances early in the morning, for example, when Metro shuts down, than they are during the middle of the day. We can also use facets to see the difference between casual and subscriber members. We can see that casual members tend to use the bikes for longer periods of time, while subscriber members are much more focused on short rides. I've also rescaled the y variable using the square root so that we can see the long tail of this distribution without it being dwarfed by the very common short rides taken by both the casual and the subscriber members. So let's wrap up. We've done a whole lot today, and you don't have to be able to do everything that we did today, but you should be able to do some of it. And in class, we'll walk through recreating many of the figures that I did today so that you can be comfortable with it. I also want to emphasize that you don't need to use the exact set of tools that I use you should figure out the way of manipulating data that you feel most comfortable with. That could be R, that could be Excel, that could be Google Spreadsheets, that could be SQL, whatever it is that you're most comfortable with, feel free to use it. However, you will need to import your data into R in order to create plots and visualizations within R and to use R's modeling software. After you've gone through and recreated many of the plots that we've done today, I hope that you'll be thinking about your first homework. And maybe you have a data set in mind, and we can start talking about some of the things you need to do to get that data set into a usable form so that you can make cool visualizations and understand your data. We have just scratched the surface of ggplot2. I don't know all of all there is to know about ggplot2. It's a very deep subject. I'm still learning too. The key is to practice. There are lots and lots of examples of using ggplot2 on the web. I encourage you to search them out and to work by example and also work from each other. You guys will have good ideas, good insights. I encourage you to use Piazza to share tricks that you've learned about ggplot2 with the rest of the class and include the commands that you use and also the end plots. After what we've gone through today, you should have everything you need to do to complete the first homework. For the first homework, you'll, you'll play around with some data that I gave you. Then you'll also find some data of your own, massage it so that it's in a usable form that you can use, find interesting relationships in your data, and then use ggplot2 and rattle to display those relationships. And I encourage you to be creative and thorough. I'll also show some examples that people did last year of really interesting plots and data sets.